Gail, let's move on. And okay, so your patient comes in, newly diagnosed AML, and has a FLIP3 mutation. Um, doesn't matter, I just heard if it's an ITD or TKD, we now add mitostorin. Why? Well, I think that, um, you know, the ratified trial, um, which took a long time and a lot of centers to accomplish, but really demonstrated a survival benefit with the addition of mitostorin to standard conventional chemotherapy. I think that that um, very quickly was adopted as the standard of care. We were really ripe for looking for something to add to seven and three, first of all. And secondly, that was, you know, ushering in an era of targeted therapy. So you have these patients who are coming in. Many of them are actually quite proliferative and scary. So there is a proliferative signal conferred by the mutation. So you, these are the ones who come in, you know, sometimes with that 150,000 white count and a head bleed or other things that are going on. So I think that um, Mark's point about get the testing done, figure out what you're dealing with. We're going to add my Mitostorin. Mitostorin is generally quite well tolerated. I would say there are some rashes, there are some GI toxicities that can happen. There is some nausea, there is some vomiting that can happen, so you have to look out for that. But in general, the overall aggregate data showed that there was um, a clear win with respect to survival. And actually, the suggestion, which I think was alluded to a few minutes ago, is that kind of FLT3 inhibition throughout. So FLT3 um, as part of the initial therapy, then um, if you're not getting a transplant, then many patients are getting FLT3 inhibitors as part of consolidation and even subsequent maintenance therapy. And then after transplant, there is a strong trend for maintenance too. So I think transplant is not, unfortunately, actually the end. It's not one and done, but there's ongoing FLT3 inhibition that is largely practiced, not completely with data, but with strong suggestive data that ongoing FLT3 inhibitors might be a good idea for some patients even post-transplant. I think we're waiting for the confirmatory uh, data for that. And Mark looks like he's about to- but not, but not necessarily with mitostorin. Right, so that was, that was the, but I mean, I think for right now, we just have to be careful. I mean, we're the, the obviously the news is whether or not gilteritinib, for example, would be moved forward um, in induction, consolidation, post-transplant maintenance, what would be the role there? Is it actually better to use than mitostorin? Is it better tolerated? I think that for right now, mitostorin in combination with chemotherapy is the upfront standard, but I think that there is the anticipation that gilteritinib may have um, a lot to offer both upfront and post-transplant maintenance. Dan, so Dan I, let me ask you a question here, pull you into this conversation. So, you know, mitostorin maintenance is approved in Europe, but not in the United States based on the same uh, ratified trial data. Based, and this was due to the peculiarities of the design where patients were re-randomized at the time of maintenance assignment. Do you use mitostorin maintenance? And um, is there anything that makes you think that it's really valuable here? Yeah, you know, in, in our setting, um, much like I think what has been referred to before, you know, a, a, an eligible for chemotherapy FLT3 positive patient who gets induction plus mitostorin, uh, if they get into a remission, is going to go to a transplant. And so, um, you know, there are, of course, all kinds of contingencies and, uh, and uh, bumps in the road that can, um, that can you know, take you off that path. But for the most part, it's not, um, it's not a, uh, a big issue for us uh, for that reason. If, if, they, if, if the plan was from the uh, get-go for them to go through induction, then they're going to go to a transplant and, and move on from there. Now, whether there should be a role for post-transplant maintenance with an agent, I think Amir and, and Mark already kind of referred to. So for us, it's, um, it's a... Uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a sphere without a real um, uh, treatment for that reason. But what I will say is that if we were in that situation, and we have been, where a patient you know, gets induction, gets into a remission, does not go to transplant, we would consolidate that patient with mitostorin, and we would follow essentially what the Ratify study uh, randomized patients to with a, a maintenance program with mitostorin, even, uh, even if that's not uh, you know, the, the labeled indication in this country. Yeah. Okay. So my, my objection to that approach, which is a reasonable approach, is that we know more than half patients that are on this bad smelling pill come off it because they can't tolerate it. In fact, the AML SG study basically had 57% of patients leave the treatment because they couldn't tolerate the stuff. 
So it isn't okay, that well, it, you, we don't like it, <laughs> but. Well, you opened that can of worms. So the, the FDA label, you know, the FDA doesn't want to be ageist, but the Ratify trial was in patients up to the age of 59, not 60 or over. And it, the, the data that was used to support the use in older patients was the German AML 1610 study that took older patients. The 65. Only, I'm sorry. Up only, to 65, yeah. Yes, only up to that, uh, above that age, right? But only based on historical comparator was it better yeah. than, you know, uh, chemotherapy without mitostorin. And you're right, they saw more toxicity in those older patients as well. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm still impressed by Dick Larson's presentation of, of uh, what happened to patients who were known to be on mitostorin for maintenance. Um, and when they stopped it, there was this rapid 25% decrease in the disease-free survival, yeah. uh, which suggests maybe in some patients it's doing something. And patients relapse from, we're going to see this data soon, patients relapse from that, from that treatment with the ITD mutation still present. You know, not it's about, they, about half of them will relapse. When they relapse, they, they have the ITD still there. So there's clearly potentially a role for it.